You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. We are on the hot seat, folks. Pat and Eric. Welcome, everyone, to Holly Pat. Um, we're excited to talk with each other, actually, because it's been a couple of weeks. But for y'all, it'll be a pretty normal weekly episode. But how's it going, Pat? You were uh, you mentioned before this that you were kind of put on the hot seat with questions last week from Catholic Answers. So, yes, yeah, I had that. the I had the privilege to be invited on Catholic Answers Live, and they put me on the segment of. I guess the atheism segment where we take calls from people who, who don't believe in God or, or agnostic or something like that. Interestingly enough, I don't think I got a single call from, from, from an actual atheist. I got a bunch oh. of really, really interesting calls from, I, I think mostly Catholics who just had a, a variety of um, different questions. I'll call them different questions. And, and I okay. like that because it kind of kept me on my toes. Like I got questions about aliens and, and stuff I don't oh, normally. Oh, wow. Yeah, just stuff I don't normally think about or consider. So it was, it was actually a really fun time. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, I was ready to go, you know, let's, let's talk yeah. arguments for the existence of God, of course, because that's kind of where I, I focus. But it, uh, it, it, took a, it took an interesting, but I thought very fun and eclectic turn so that's hilarious yeah. what what was the hardest question to answer if you don't mind me asking i i don't know if there were any like really difficult questions um but let me let me try and remember i, I one of the somebody asked what i thought the best objection to some of the fine i got i did get a number of questions on like the fine tuning argument for god okay. if people are familiar with that when we look at the kind of physical constants and quantities and make an inference to a, a super intellect to explain them and, um, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the literature on, on that argument. It's not been like my specialization, but I can, I can spar on that. And, but mostly people were, um, I got questions about evolution, which was interesting. Um, mm-hmm. and one, one question was just like, do we come from apes? And I thought that was that. And I tried to address that from a couple of angles. One is that sometimes that's a little too simplistic of what evolutionary theory actually says. It's more mm-hmm. about common ancestry. It doesn't mean that we like directly came from from this or that that ape. So just trying to clear up some misconceptions. And I guess my my general project there was just trying to get Catholics to see that there is no there's no conflict right yeah. between the Catholic faith and contemporary theories of evolution. I'm more interested in that than um, you know going to the mat trying to critique evolutionary theory. Even though I do think that there are serious critiques to consider mm-hmm. in that. I I, I just for me, when it comes to Catholic apologetics or apologetics in general, I just want to make sure that people are, are choosing their battles wisely mm-hmm. and allocating their you know, resources, especially when it comes to studying certain subject matters, wisely. And, and evolution to me always seemed, and I try to make this clear on, on, on the conversation, it's, it's something we can just completely like, run around. It's, exactly. not, it's, it's, just not, it's just not an issue. Like, and it never was for me either. Like, when I was becoming Catholic, I was never hung up on the evolutionary question because well for one thing for evolution to even take hold it requires a very finely tuned universe right Right. so if you want to talk about design and teleology i think there's many better arguments for that that we can make either from physical fine-tuning or even deeper metaphysical arguments so i tried to push that line i thought that was an interesting conversation point and it just it reminds me and this was uh, something that is always good for me it reminds me that the things i'm thinking about are very often not the things that many other people are thinking <laughs> yeah. about. Uh, and that's, but, and that's kind of a problem because I'm, I mean, we both produce content, so I should, I should like, kind of get back in check, I guess. Yeah. With, uh, Me with the, the people. Yeah. yeah. With, with the people in the pew. Cause clearly there's this g- disconnect. I was kind of surprised at some yeah. of the questions where I'm thinking like, this isn't really an issue, but, but for them it was an issue. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that was something I had to reflect on afterwards is, okay, well, just because I don't think it's an issue doesn't mean that somebody else is, isn't struggling with it. So I need to make sure that I'm better paying attention to the, to the struggles of most everyday people, even if it's not something that I think is, is a problem. So those are, those are just, I guess, a few initial reflections. Yeah. That's interesting because when I was like in middle school and I was more fundamentalist Baptist then, and really thought like, I have to win the evolution argument. 
or else they won't believe in God, you know? And my views changed later on and it was beautiful to see not necessarily, my views didn't necessarily change on whether or not I believe evolution to be true, but the fact that it doesn't even matter whether or not it's true, it pulled the rug right out from under the atheist argument. And it was like, well, actually you can still believe in God and these aren't mutually exclusive. And that's to me so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well let's focus on other things now because that's, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I agree. And I think it, uh, you know, I kind of came in different from you. I came in from the kind of greater metaphysical project. And that's like, evolution just really says nothing about that. Like, it just just doesn't matter, right? Like, with the metaphysical arguments go through, theism is the case, at least. And then it's like, if there is a point of tension, we have to, we have to unpack it. So if somebody is promoting what what might be called like evolutionism, which is the idea that you can reduce everything to evolution, well, then we have a problem, but that isn't contemporary mainstream evolutionary theory. That's right. a very, very specific philosophical position, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like scientism, right? It's like scientism right. applied to evolution. And so like, yeah, that's an issue. And we should read, everybody should reject that because it's, it's just patently ridiculous. Um, but yeah, just, you know, mainstream evolutionary theory. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes people just kind of throw it out there. It's like, well, well what, do you, what do you see? as the problem, I guess. And then if you, if, if um, people start pushing it hard enough, they might say, well, you know, the Bible says that the earth was created in six days, but then you just say, well, well, look, like even in the earliest parts of the tradition, we have Catholics like St. Augustine who say, well, there's so much of Genesis that we're is supposed to be taken allegorically. And this is like yeah. some 1500 years before Darwin. And right. they're not, they're not interpreting that literally. So it's not like, it's not like it's a retreat of the exactly. Catholic church exactly. in the face of, of science. No, like this is the, the, the church fathers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and there's different traditions in the tradition, right? There were some right. that were more literalist. There were some that were almost purely allegorical when it comes at least to a lot of the old Testament. And then there were who I think were the best who had mixed interpretations, yep. right? Well, this should be taken allegorically. This should be taken literally. And we just kind of have to parse through that. Mm-hmm. And that goes all the way back. So I just, I, I, I like to emphasize that. It's like, okay, well, if you think that it's like conflicting with some biblical data, I think you just have a kind of crude understanding of, of scripture. Right, right exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to put you back on the hot seat and you're going to put me on the hot seat, but it's going to be friendly, friendly, friendly fire. And, uh, you know, before when we, yeah, before we did a, a, the two minute drill Q&A thing, I don't think we'll have a timer, but, you know, we'll try to give succinct answers as best we can. Um, but I remember last time it was like, let's intentionally do more philosophical and theological things. But this time it's more open-ended. So I, I actually just thought of some cool questions that I just want to hear your opinion on, really. Sweet. And so if you don't mind, I'll just, uh, I'll just go for it here let's, with question number one. Let's go. Okay. And, and, and just to reaffirm, we do not share these questions with each other in advance. Right. He has yeah. no idea what I'm about to say. Yep. And for my listeners, if you haven't checked out Pat Flynn's podcast, please check it out, especially if you're interested in fitness, because it's like, what, five days a week you're talking about fitness, and then you have philosoph- uh, philosophy Fridays, and then Sunday school on Sundays. Yep. You come yeah, out with an episode every day. And almost, pretty much. I, yeah, 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 more, more days than not. And that's, yeah. that's a general structure. So throughout the week, I'm, I'm chatting, you know, the practical fitness stuff. And then I like to have fun on Fridays with ph- some philosophy. Yes. Things. And then Sundays, sometimes they just hear us on Sundays for yes. Holly Pat and other times some other guests, but yeah. And you, it. you wrote the book kettlebells for dummies. No, I didn't write that one. Oh. I wrote, um, so this can be confusing because there is a book called Kettlebells for Dummies and people think I wrote that one. I didn't. I wrote Paleo Workouts for Dummies. Oh, wow. And they, okay. and they, came, they came out at similar times and it's confusing because my book <laughs> is all about kettlebell training, right? And it's wow. all and, and body weight and strength training. And I often lament about the title because it was published by Wiley at the sort of height of the paleo craze. And um, this was a big point of contention with me and the publisher. Cause I said, look, look, in like five years from now, paleos is going to be dead. Like nobody's, and it is dead. Who's <laughs> <laughs> the kettlebells are going strong, but kettlebells are still going. And unfortunately the book still sells well. Um, I just wish, I just wish they would change the title on it. But yeah, that one is mine. Kettlebells for dummies is written by somebody who's kind of in the same, um, I would say weightlifting school okay. or tradition as me. So yeah. it's a solid book, but yeah, that one is, is not mine. Yes. Well, I had to preface it this way. Cause my first question is this, how do you see physical fitness con- connected to spirituality? 
Yeah, huge. I mean, God, so the first thing I think to remember here is that uh, Catholics aren't Gnostics, right? The material world isn't some bad, evil mm-hmm. thing to be escaped from. God gave us bodies. God gave us a physical, material world. And all things, all things considered, or all else equal, that's a good thing. That's, and, and part of our belief in the resurrection is it will be a physical, bodily resurrection. So our faith as Catholics is not to escape the body. It's not to escape the world of the material uh, but for it to be redeemed um, and, uh, and, and, and to appreciate, I think, our physical aspects. And that the soul, and it's important, again, in the tradition when we're thinking about the soul, both philosophically and theologically from, in the Catholic tradition, is that the body was always seen to be in the soul, not mm. the soul in the body, which is kind of the way that modern philosophers of oh. mind, like Cartesians, think about it. Whereas the soul is that really that first organizing principle of a thing. This kind of comes out of Aristotelian philosophy. So yeah, it would be more proper to say that the body is contained in the soul. The soul is the sort of formal cause rather than, you know, you know, not to paint too crude of a picture of Cartesian philosophy of like the soul being like a ghost in a machine, right? There was mm-hmm. never this, there was never this, what we call the, the mind body problem in, in classical philosophy, not as we typically see it today. Um, so why is that important? Well, it's important because if God gave us bodies he wants us to be bodily creatures Mm. and there are going to be certain things that are perfective of us um, that will be physical that will be material so i very much see part of the the spiritual life being a very much a physical thing and that's that's something i very much i love and appreciate about catholicism it's so it's so physical i mean we have the sacraments uh the the physicality of that but even just the way that we, we we pray and worship there's tons of physicality i mean people sometimes poke fun at all the Catholic calisthenics we do, right? In, in, in mass. <laughs> Kneel, stand, Kneel, bow, stand, bow, right? But this is what we are. We are physical creatures. So it yeah. makes sense that our worship should be in some sense physical. So for me, um, and this is my thinking has changed through this over time, um, because let's be honest, when I first got into fitness, when I was like, you know, 16, 15, 16, I just, I just wanted to be like impressive to girls. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) But now, but now, and like, that's not a great mindset to be in. It it got me started. So it was what it was, but now I see it as connecting to the, to the virtuous life, uh, entirely. Mm. So I see fitness as being things that can help you to develop in at least the natural virtues like temperance and fortitude. I mean, it, you think of a fortitude as, as kind of that grit virtue. Like we know that something is good for us, but it's going to be challenging to get that something. And yeah. where can where can you experience that? You know, except, I mean, where where better can you experience that for most people in real time outside the spiritual life than in, I would say, the gym or in physical activity, mm-hmm. physical exercise? So yeah, I, at this point, I almost forget your question, but do I, do I think that it's important? I think it's hugely important. I also want to say that if you're like, you're like severely physically impeded, if you're not taking care of yourself physically, it's very hard to have a spiritual life. Mm. Uh, um, I mean, if you're in, if you're in pain, if you're just, you know, incredibly overweight and unhealthy, that's going to spill over, not into, I mean, it's going to spill over into, into potential vice in other areas of your life. So we yeah. got to be thinking in terms of the virtues. Um, but these are things that are, that may hinder your spiritual practices mm-hmm. as well. Whereas if you're doing the best you can to stay healthy, stay active, of course, I'm not saying everybody needs to be a professional power lifter or bodybuilder, but taking care of the gifts that God ga- right. ga- gave you is a virtuous activity. And everything is so deeply connected here that when we do that on the physical level, I think it's just at least going to uh, facilitate our spiritual practices yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. And our scripture says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so that alone should give us cause to take care of our bodies. And then I always come back to this verse in uh, 1 Timothy 4, um, verse 8, or sorry, verse uh, 7. Train yourself in godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is a value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And so I like that because it does actually affirm physical bodily training has some value. It, yeah. And this is, this is, key, huge. is of, is of some value. And I would push yeah. back on a lot of the fitness industry where they make it the, like, it's the only thing of value. Exactly. Because you, at the end of the day, like if you live to your 90 and then die, let's say your body's going to shrink and shrivel up and like you will die, but you still have your soul. And obviously we believe in the resurrection of our bodies at the end of time. Right. But that's just to say is like, 
what really is going to carry forth into eternity is that charity in our hearts, that love, that godliness that we, he's talking about there. And so we need both. And I like how you point out the interconnectedness between, you know, the physical and the spiritual when it comes to like, yeah, if you're just not even taking care of it and you're neglecting your body, not being a good steward of it, that can lead to vices. Mm-hmm. And, and also a, an aspect of fitness I really like is offering up a, a hard workout Oh yeah. And you knew with Christ suffering for the salvation of the world. It's just mm-hmm. like a game changer to me. It, it's a, yeah, it's totally tweaks the mindset in a positive way. I'm with you. Yeah. So that was cool, man. I appreciate that. All and right, cool. I, yeah. All right. Well, let me hit you now. Let me get up my document here and, uh, all right. Stump the professor. All right. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, I think this will be kind of a softball for you because this is something of your specialty, but we just had a very important feast day. So Eric, I would like you to explain and possibly defend the assumption. What is it and why do Catholics teach it? Yeah, so the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary is that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven, into the glory of heaven. And so she shared in a special way in Christ's passion, right? She was at the foot of the cross with John the Apostle, and she shared in a very special way, obviously, with Christ's own um, body given for us in his incarnation. And the word being flesh was happening in the flesh of Mary, And so we see this intimate connection between Jesus and Mary from beginning to end there. And so as she participated in a unique way in the incarnation and then in the cross, so also she participates in a unique way in the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And she gives us hope, right? Because we're all destined to that destiny, um, the resurrection of our bodies. And there's a few um, different biblical ways to explain this. Well, first of all, in, in Revelation chapter 12, Uh, 11 and 12, it talks about this Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And then it kind of zooms in and John writes, and then there's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown 12 stars in her head. This woman is obviously Mary because she gives birth to the sun that will rule all the nations. And it's also, of course, representing the church, which Mary is the model of the church and the new Israel and all of that. So it's multiple things going on there, but there's a woman in heaven. And, um, And so she's the new Ark of the Covenant. And that signifies a certain physicality there um, that she's not just this spiritual vision of a woman, but it's like, actually, no, there's a real woman there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also we have that she's the new Eve and, uh, and the old Eve was born without any original sin and then fell into sin. The new Eve was also born without original sin. That's the um, dogma, of the immaculate conception. And she remains sinless. Well, it's not fitting and not right for someone who hasn't sinned to decay in the grave. Um, Like Jesus, he didn't decay in the grave. That's why it's important that he rose on the third day. Because in Jewish way of thinking, if you stayed in the tomb four days, like Lazarus did, your body was already rotting, which the Lord promised that the Holy One will not see corruption. That's why it was so important that Jesus raised on the third day. And that's why even if you believe that Mary um, died, which you can, like it's possible we just know that her earthly life ended. We don't know whether or not she was taken up before that moment of her soul parting from the body or whatever, but we have to believe that she was, she was raised, that she didn't decay because she is that new Eve, um, that sinless woman. And so to me, it's, it's just awesome that she is a model for us. So in everything that you see in her life, she's basically a forerunner for what the church is. So her yes to God saying, behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord, be done unto me according to thy word that's a model for us to receive whatever God initiates with us in utter humility and and receptivity. So we can bring forth the God man now as well. Um, And so she also does that with the resurrection. And so she's going where we're going. So she is the star of the sea and, um, and our hope. And that dogma was defined later. It was defined, I believe it was 1950 by Pius XII. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that's okay. Cause the, the theology and the, all the things that were undergirding that were present from the beginning, like in seed form, like we talked about in one of our recent yep. episodes. Everything's there in seed form, and then the church articulates it over time when these things come up, when issues come up, like defining the Trinity in the 300s at the Council mm-hmm. of Nicaea 325. Well, they always believed it, but then they had to define it because of errors around there. So I don't have a problem at all with the church declaring it definitively in 1950. It's not like it, they invented it. it. It was there already. It's just like to help the faithful to say, hey, we don't even need to question this anymore. This is just what it is. And it's I love binding. that. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm with you. I, it's a beautiful teaching. It really yeah. is. And um, 
it, the one thing I wanted to um, well, first off, I, that is that, that's interesting about the the corruption part. I actually didn't know that. That's 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 a new uh, yeah. thing for me. So that's very cool. Um, the other thing that kind of struck me when I was first kind of like looking into the to the Mary and stuff, and again, this wasn't a big holdup for me with Catholicism. As oh, I you're going to say but, apparitions? As for you, well, yeah, apparitions are imp- okay. are are cool and important, but also. Um, uh, the uh, just the fact that there are no relics of Mary, I always found yes. interesting. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. So that's a huge thing because, like, in all these saints that we have, like you see in Polycarp's story, that's actually the first um, outside of the scripture. That's the first witness that we have of relics because the after he was martyred, the, his followers took his bones and put them in an altar, and they would celebrate his birthday into heaven. So that's liturgically a feast day of a saint that's recorded in 155 AD. Yep. Um, and but we don't have that with Mary. We see the Dormition of Mary. We see the church of the Dormition in Jerusalem. And um, I think there's another one in Ephesus. Uh, But anyway, we don't have relics. We don't have her bones. We don't have like, and you would expect like of all the saints, like they would definitely do that for her. Oh, 100%. But because she was bodily assumed into heaven, we don't. And that's a huge testimony. Yeah. 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 At least like maybe if you're listening, you're not Catholic. Like, okay, like, you know, like where I, I always like to think of like a, a scale of, of like, where does, where does the evidence fall for or against the fact that there's no relics, however much evidence you think it is, I think definitely falls in the scale of, okay, that definitely is on yeah. in favor of the assumption hypothesis. And so. I understand like that when you first like hear that dogma, you, well, like, at least me when I was doing that as a Protestant, when I was hearing these things, I was like, Oh, what? But really once you start diving into the theology and then also it comes back again to the authority of the Catholic church and they're having the authority to interpret the scriptures and tradition and like all of that. And when you get that, it's like a domino effect where it's like, okay, they've been right about all of these other things. They've been right about the Eucharist, about baptismal regeneration. They've been right about all of these things. I'm going to trust them on this, even if I'm not fully there yet in my mind. And that's okay. Like, yeah, you can just have that uh, religious ascent. Right. Because they, it, it, are trustworthy exactly that's the key yeah cool good stuff man you handled that one well as all right this might be a little hot button one for you and but i'm just curious in light of the election season elections coming up presidential election (laughs) my question is how do you process through who to vote for in political political elections so specifically biden versus trump right what are your thoughts there yeah so let's Let's put aside, if we can just bracket it so that way we can keep this uh, shorter uh, conversation, let's bracket the option of being a third party voter, right, for now, because that's a, that's a whole other discussion of, okay. of whether, because some people will argue a third party vote is just a vote for the winner. So I, let's just bracket that off and say you're, you're determined to pick between um, Trump and uh, Biden. For me, and you know, this will be provocative, but I think the answer for Catholics is eminently clear, given the moral priority of certain issues at stake. And the church has made this clear. The bishops have made this clear. Life issues are the highest priority for Catholics, and they should be. So when it comes to specifically abortion, we have one, not just one candidate, but one party that it becomes more and more radical on the issue. And it, I, I hesitate to even use the term more radical when it comes to abortion. I've articulated this before because abortion just is radical in and of itself, right? Right. Murder is murder. Anytime you murder somebody, right? It doesn't become any less murder right. because they're a little bit older or a little bit younger. If we really have a human being right there at conception, which I believe we have the best philosophical arguments and scientific evidence to support, abortion just is murder. It is. This yeah. is, and I've said it before that I am absolutely convinced that this is our contemporary culture's moral blind spot, just like slavery was before. And just how so many people today are just pointing fingers back at how, how much of a moral failure people were because they didn't recognize how horrible slavery was, but they don't want to take a step back and think, well, is it possible that we may have our own moral blind spots? Mm. And I am absolutely convinced that this is it. This is this slavery, the Holocaust of our days, where people have essentially been been duped. I don't think most people are, are evil. I don't think people who advocated for slavery were necessarily evil. I think that they were just suffering from a severe moral blind spot in most mm. cases. Some were evil, no doubt. Some were. Um, but I think most people just were born into a society that had this blind spot. They just assumed certain things that were wrong, never significantly questioned them. Uh, so 
I very much believe that this is, is the abortion issue. And so I think that this issue is so extreme that whatever else you think about Biden, whatever else you think about Trump, we have a clear priority of issues that this kicks in. It overrides other issues that you might mm-hmm. think are important, issues of health care, issues of immigration, issues of education. All those are important issues, but none of them are as morally clear cut or as straightforward in terms of, of policy debate as abortion, right? Abortion is really one of those black and white issues. Mm-hmm. Like if this really is what people in the pro-life position say it is, which I'm, I'm convinced that it is – then this is uh, a moral abomination on the scale of something like we have never really seen in this world before. And that means as Catholics, we are morally obligated uh, to to fight this uh, as strongly as we can. And that might mean endorsing a candidate that we might we might not like his other positions. We might not like his positions on education or health care or taxation or whatever. But the moral priority here seriously kicks in Mm. for Catholics. That you have to have a sort of, I think, a political and moral maturity to perhaps just swallow hard on certain things and say, no, this is such an issue that I need to go for this candidate. In this case, it would be it would be Trump. In the same sense that if you had a candidate that was out there promoting slavery, regardless of what you think of the opposing candidates, you know, you might he might be promoting slavery, but you love his health care plan. He might be promoting slavery and you love his education plan. He might be yeah. promoting slavery and you love none of those things matter. <laughs> like, yeah. He's promoting something that is so intrinsically right. evil, right? That there's an overriding factor yeah. of of other issues. So I would say that there's many issues that do not legitimate, I think, a single issue vote. But the abortion issue is one, especially for Catholics, especially since the church is so clear on the teaching yeah. of this, that I don't think there's any way around it. I think if it's between those two, Catholics, you have to take the you have to take responsibility in this. You have to vote for Trump. Yeah. Wow. And the, one of the ways I think about it too is like if if you don't even believe in protecting the innocent life of these babies, how can I trust you to protect my guilty life? <laughs> You know, like if you don't protect the most innocent among us, how can I trust when you talk about my rights? You don't even care about rights, really. Like you don't care about the most fundamental ones. Wait, and that, I don't know. I guess I, I get well, no. Little, that's something I want to echo, right? Because a lot of these other things that we care, like even take the abortion debate. Do you mind if we spend a few more minutes? On no, this? yeah, go for okay. it. Yeah, um, because there's certain ways that it's rhetorically positioned that I think um, creates this moral blind spot in people it's positioned as protecting protecting a woman's right to privacy or a woman's right to property now privacy and property are good things and when and under you know other situations when these things are violated we rightfully should uh, protest those violations however however in ethics and moral philosophy and certainly in moral theology um property and privacy are instrumental rights they are rights that extend from and have value only in virtue of the more fundamental right, which is the right to life. Yeah. So you cannot override or overlook the right to life, which is the case against abortion, by bringing in some less fundamental rights, such as property or privacy. So mm-hmm. yes, we respect women's rights. Yes, we respect property rights. Of course we do. But we respect the most fundamental rights most fundamentally, and that is the right to life. So there's just a confusion on the hierarchy of rights and and the priority that needs to be afforded to life issues. And you have to you have to just focus on that and you have to put aside whatever else your personal feelings are about the candidates right now. And I know mm-hmm. there's many and just try and gain that moral clarity to make the most prudent decision. And and here's another thing about about ethics, right? Sometimes you have ethical situations where there's no good answer, right? right? Sometimes the answer is just bad option A or worse option B. But as good moral philosophy should teach you, we have doctrines of double effect where you can still make the right decision even if you have two bad choices, right? So for example, let me give just a a more commonplace example. My kid is going to go run out into the street, right? And I have only a minute to react and I – decide, well, to stop him from getting hit by a bus, I'm going to shove him out of the way. And he might hit a mailbox and get hurt, right? And that's mm-hmm. the only alternative I see. I'm going to shove him, but he's going to hit that mailbox. He might even cut his head open and say that he does. Well, those were two bad options, right? Bad option one was getting hit by the bus. Bad option was me pushing my kid. And the only trajectory I had at the time was he hit his head on a mailbox. Was I wrong to push my kid? 
No, of course not. Right. That was the morally right thing to do given that situation yeah. at hand. And it was still, it's still a bad thing. It's a bad thing that he split his head open. It's a bad thing that he got pushed into the mailbox, but that was the right action to do. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a certain uh, maturity that has to be acknowledged here. And I think that this is a clear cut issue. And again, yeah. same, thing with, same thing with immigration. Let's talk about immigration, right? Because everyone wants to kind of conflate this. Immigration is not a clear cut issue like abortion because there are moral principles where the nation is sort of the extension of the family unit. Mm -hmm. and, and just like I have a moral priority to protect my family uh, before just letting anybody into my house, the nation has a moral priority to make sure that it protects and serves its citizens before letting anybody else in. Now that's counterbalanced in the same way that it, it's counterbalanced in the family that I still have a priority to go out and care for others, right? Mm, but there's a yeah. balancing that has to happen between my going out and caring for others and just letting anybody into my house, especially when it might be a threat to my family or my children, right? So there's, there's room there for debate on specific policy. And just as it would be irrational and immoral to just let anybody in at any point in my house that especially might put my family at risk it is irrational and immoral for countries to just let anybody in mm -hmm. at any time right so immigration having an immigration process is it's prudent it's moral it's important now we want that to be a humane process we want it to be a fair process mm -hmm. um and we should all but so what the point i'm saying is this is a less clear-cut and fundamental issue than abortion so this is there's room here for important, uh, you know, and reasonable debate on something like immigration. It's just no, it's yeah. just way more fuzzy than the abortion issue. Um, so I just want to bring that up yeah. because people will say, well, we'll look at how bad Trump is on immigration. And then we could get into details of whether he's really bad, whether he, or whether he just inherited an already terrible mm -hmm. system of policies. But the, the point for now is on matter of priority and principle, you're not going to be able to override the abortion issue with other right. issues, especially not for Catholics. And that should be a determining factor in how you vote. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah man. Well, thanks for putting me on the spot for that one. <laughs> All right. This Next is only one. a test. Oh, well, you know, here's, I, so you just, I just answered this question that I'm going to ask you, honestly. Oh. Um, but now I get to, I get to throw it your way. Um, so I, uh, my question is this, Eric, if you could ask somebody, who might be completely opposed to everything you believe. Let's just say they're totally opposite. But, but they, they grant you a wish and they say, Eric, I will seriously reconsider any one thing that you believe, um, whether it's religious or political, but just one thing. Uh, so what I'm asking you, Eric, of, what, of any of your beliefs that somebody might be completely the opposite on, which one would you most want them to reconsider and why? That Jesus is God in the flesh because that changes everything like if he's god in the flesh then you can trust him you can trust um the church you can trust the resurrection happening like all of it and obviously those all these are interconnected right but like if jesus is god then you got to listen to him and you got to like you're accountable to him and you also get a revelation of the nature of god and that he loves you and that he died for you and he actually cares about you. And so I think if you get that revelation, he's not just merely a prophet, not just merely a good teacher, but he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, then, whoa, you can get to divinization, which is God became man that man might share in the very life of God. And understanding that Jesus is God is pivotal for their salvation. So that they can experience the glory of, of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, kind of a softball for you, but thanks. <laughs> of course, I'm of course I'm going to strongly agree with that on the on the religious. Well, is part. that one thing that you would say? What what's another one that you would say? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for me, that just seems yeah, that seems like the most obvious one because yeah. if you can make that commitment, I think, like you said, it's it everything else is going to kind of snap into place. Right, me. right. Um, or at least a lot of things will and should, uh, particularly if you're if you're if you make that move from Catholicism. So yeah, if there's one thing, I'm sitting down with somebody who says, I will honestly and openly reconsider any one of the things that we disagree on. I think that that would be probably, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be. It. And to me, the theology is so important, because that affects every aspect of your life like 
because you're going to change the way you behave. You're going to change maybe even your political opinions or sociological opinions. Everything filters through that. And so right. it, it really has a cascading effect. That's why I would choose a theological question rather than um, other questions. Yeah. And look, yeah. And just one more thing about <laughs> you brought up the politics thing. So I got to say one more <laughs> one more thing about it. I am not a mainstream American Republican. Um, and I'm not saying that because like a lot of people, I think they, they feign uh, something that kind of bothers me. I think about a lot of people who are Republicans is they pretend not to like Trump, but they really do. Um, if you like Trump, just say it and defend it. Don't say like, Oh, I vote for him begrudgingly or this or that. Hmm. So I'm not taking that position. Um, the position I'm taking is, is saying I'm a common good conservative. And this comes out of my deeper metaphysical, ethical, and religious commitments as a Catholic. And a common good conservative is actually quite different than sort of a mainstream American Republicanism. For me, a, a sort of Republican in, in America these days is really just another type of classical liberal. It's on the spectrum of liberalism, just like libertarianism, just like progressivism. They're all on the same political spectrum to me. Whereas a common good perspective, like you got to go, <laughs> you got to take like 10 big steps back to get to that. And there's certain things like, and just to kind of contrast it, like a common good conservative would be, would be somebody who could at least in principle entertain a lot of uh, ideas or policies that are being promoted, say, by the Democrat or um, uh, kind of more liberal parties. Uh, policies such as, say, um, high investment in education, for example. That's something common good conservatives can and should support. And I'm not saying Republicans don't support that, but sometimes it, there seems to be this apparent divide between mm. Republicans and Democrats on education. Or even um, single-payer health care systems. Uh, that is something that, in principle, a common good conservative could support on a moral level, uh, so long as it isn't tied to, say, making you know abortion available on a federal right. level. Right. So you got to be careful to like make sure that you're not smuggling in some evil with these policies. And then you would just either like say, well, I don't think this would work just on a practical level or or I think it'd be better handled on a, on a local level or in competition. So I'm saying the way I would fall on some of these issues that uh, divide Republicans and Democrats, uh, aside from the big moral issues, which I think can't be compromised on, would really just be kind of settled empirically. Well, what's the best evidence for mm. these? Um, anyway. The reason I, I do that is because just because I say I think it's clear that you should vote for Trump in this election on, on moral grounds, it doesn't – I just don't want people to kind of bracket me off in the wrong political category. Well, and I want to add to that too because I think um, one thing that's bothersome to me is when people blindly love Trump when it's like at least admit if he makes a mistake, I, even if he doesn't admit it, like – or if he does something bad, like – it's still okay to vote for him because like nobody's perfect. Right. Like, and it's okay to vote for him when you look at these issues. Right. That doesn't mean you have to like him or that you have to, um, you just blindly have to just stamp of approval on everything he's done. Yeah, it's that, like, no, I'm voting for him because, um, this, this, and this, like he is the, you know, for me, a big evidence and I'm not going to reveal anything here for myself other than I'll say, a huge thing in his favor is that Planned Parenthood absolutely hates him. So that to me is a good signal that he's doing some good on the pro-life work, which is yeah, uh -huh. the most important issue. It's life or death. Right. Um, but uh -huh. that doesn't mean I have to blindly just, Oh, everything he says is from God. Like, you know, it's like, he's not our personal Lord and savior and no president is. And like Jesus is still King. And that needs to be, and the kingdom of God transcends the republican party my goodness like it's I okay so. <laughs> yeah and i just think people on quote unquote the other side a lot of people just long to hear like some humility like yeah we were wrong about that or right. we made a mistake here and that's okay we can admit that it's like okay. yeah there's there's two camps here there's like the camp that says that that trump can never do anything right and there's a camp that says that trump can never do anything wrong and they're both right. delusional as right. far as i'm concerned right you just got to take it piece by piece policy by policy yeah and when it comes to trump there's some policies i don't like when it and um and other policies where i just think he doesn't go far enough yeah right like i like this policy but it's not good enough and just to bring up the 
another controversial point, which I don't think should be, is he wants to make exceptions for abortion in the terms of something like rape. And I think that's a huge mistake. Somebody doesn't lose value because the manner of their conception. Right. Rapists should be punished. They should be punished severely. We want to promote everything we can in society to for a healthy family unit to stop sexualizing freaking everything. <laughs> yeah. So that's part of being a common good conservative is like getting virtue back into the citizens. But, you know, put six people in a room and – Five are conceived in marriage. One was conceived in rape. Is that per- is that person is that less of a person because they were conceived in rape? Because that's really what you're proposing when you think that we mm. should legitimate murder because of the manner of conception. And that does not give rapists an excuse by mm. any means. That's a ridiculous straw man. So that's one thing where I totally disagree with Trump. Right. And I and I think he sucks on that point. Right. Um. Quite severely. Um, where I, that's actually a, a big criticism I have of Trump. Like if you're yeah. going to be pro-life, you need to be pro-life. I think he's, he's totally right. arbitrary. So that's something that quite bothers me. Yeah. About. Yeah. And I hope All he right. changes on it, but compared yeah. to the abortion policies that at least he's, so here's what I say about Trump on a lot of policies, at least directionally where I want him to be directionally. And what I mean yeah. by directionally, even if he isn't exactly where I think it should be, he's at least moving moving the culture and the policies right. in the way they should be. Whereas on, for a number of these issues on the Democrat party, it's, to, it's the opposite. They're like moving towards infanticide. <laughs> infanticide, like, oh, yeah. Gosh. Infanticide, further destructions of the family unit, all these things that I think every Catholic and common good conservative just absolutely needs to oppose. Yeah. So anyway, we spent a ton of time on that, but these distinctions are important. And it's important because elections coming up, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Question number three for you. Explain epistemology, and the question is this, how can we really come to know things? Oh, boy. Okay, so I'm not an epistemology expert, but it does – it does. Um, it's one of those things that as a metaphysician, you kind of scratch the epistemological itch wherever it comes up. <laughs> um, epistemology is a theory of knowledge, so it asks questions about how do we know – what we know, what counts as knowledge, you know, like what, what is knowledge? Is it something like justified true belief? What are the conditions for knowledge? Um, and these are all, there's no way we're going to be able to get into this in, in two minutes. I, and there's many different epistemological schools, right? There's classical foundationalism, there's proper functionalism. Uh, and there's, of course, ex- people who would just say we can't have knowledge of, of anything at all. And then we have to, you know, differentiate between knowledge and belief. Can we know things? Yes, I think we. I think we can know things. I'm quite sympathetic with with uh, proper functionalism. Um, actually, the, a lot of this comes out of uh, a Protestant philosopher, a very brilliant Protestant philosopher named Alvin Plantinga. I've got his. Funny you bring this up. I have his famous book right here called Warranted Christian Belief. So this is wow. a fan, fantastic epistemology text. I would highly recommend it. Um, I will say I somewhat depart from some of my scholastic brethren, not all of them. Um, and I won't go as far as, and let me just, let me just uh, make a quick, uh, summary of what Plantinga's, uh, position is. He would say that, um, we have what are called properly basic beliefs that were justified in, in, in believing more or less, unless you provide some type of defeater of these beliefs. So an example would be something like this, right? Uh, that other people have minds. I can't, prove that scientifically right for all i know eric you are just a very cleverly programmed android for example right and there's no there's no test i could do there's no empirical test i could run uh to really to really figure that out right but but is it wrong to say that i i don't know that you're a human person like that doesn't seem right right so so planet would say no you're perfectly justified in what he calls these properly basic beliefs and he has the conditions out there of what of what covers a properly basic belief you know unless and until somebody provides a defeater of it like if somebody dissected you and it turns out you're a bunch of screws <laughs> and wires they'd be like oh that's freaking weird i guess i was wrong about the terminator that, right? was true all along yeah um <laughs> and planiga planiga has a, a a cool angle from that because he wants to argue that belief in god is a properly basic belief and that, and that your belief in God can be justified, warranted. That's, that's where he's getting at with warranted Christian belief, independent of any arguments. So that's kind of, that's kind of the nature of his project. He wants to say like, you don't even need arguments to be uh, justified in your belief of God, because he wants to say that on an epistemic level, this is one of those properly basic beliefs that unless somebody can provide a defeater of it, then you are perfectly rational to continue on in your belief. 
And uh, he extends that. He extends probably basic beliefs maybe farther than I would be willing to go because he wants to kind of – he almost wants to extend it to cover the whole of the Christian gospel. Oh, wow. In some respect. I don't know, or at least the main facets of the Christian gospel, I don't know if I'm going to follow him that far. But I'm quite sympathetic to his general epistemological project overall. And there's a wonderful convert to Catholicism uh, who is uh, who is an epistemologist. His name's Tyler McNabb, and he's very much a proper functionalist. Uh, and he's been doing some very interesting work of how how this ties actually into the Catholic faith. So he'd be somebody to check out. He's All got right. he's got at least two books out on epistemology, um, and. Uh, what would be who would be some some other my friend tim mcgrew if you want a counter a counter point uh he's more of a classic foundationalist mm. um and he is also a christian so uh, this is something where there's of course tremendous debate even uh you know not just between you know people who are christian and not christian but even in the christian christian world itself but that's right. a that's a summary of epistemology that's good anyways Thanks. right yeah but one quick, because I feel like I'm not doing a great service here. The idea is, I think Planet wants to argue, is that so long as you know God made us a certain way, and mm-hmm. that our 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 faculties are functioning in the way that they're supposed to function in the environment they're designed to function in, that can start to give the the sort of um, basis for a properly basic belief. For example. All right. That's yeah. Nice. I think that was great. Thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. epistemology is fun. It's important. All right, and like you're gonna you're gonna come up to it at some point, no matter what area of philosophy you dive into. Right. So that's what that's why I said like you know I, I kind of scratched the epistemological itch as it as, yeah. it comes up, as as it is it's relevant to my projects. Well, uh, I think one reason why I like to ask that question is because you can picture like a, a really annoying kid just being like, "Well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? And how do you know that?" And it's like, okay, well, we need to know how we know. Like that's a basic thing that we should probably talk about so and and, and look this is a lot of that was kind of driving descartes again do you mind if we spend a little bit more yeah yeah it's uh, it's just kind of fun right skeptical Um, of everything well yeah so descartes you know one can sympathize with descartes because he's he's not so different than than we are today he was living give me some firm footing somewhere (laughs) yeah so he's living in a time where there's a lot of there's, it's it's a pluralistic time, even for Descartes. People believe a lot of different things politically, even religiously in Descartes' time. And he was really impressed by sort of mathematics. He's like, well, people have all these different beliefs and religion and politics, but like most people agree that two plus two equals four, right? So what Descartes kind of wanted to do of like the whole kind of both epistemology and metaphysics and religion is he wanted to try and get a sort of mathematical-like certainty for things like the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. And his project was extremely ambitious. I think most people say it probably didn't quite succeed to the extent he wanted it to, but you can sympathize with why he did that. And then, so he adopts, he adopts a sort of methodological skepticism and it's important to emphasize methodological. So most people are familiar with Descartes thought experiments. Like how do you know that you're just not hallucinating or that some demon isn't deceiving you and right. the external world is really real and people misinterpret that. They're like Descartes didn't really like seriously entertain that as the way things might be. Um, he's using this as a methodology to say to really like, well, how, how do we know that isn't the case? Like he's mm-hmm. just asking a serious, like he wasn't like a, he wasn't a paranoid man so far as we know, right. Who was really like tormented by this, even though many philosophy one-on-one students have been tormented by this uh, thought experiment. <laughs> um, and Descartes got a kind of interesting way out of it in the sense that he's like, well, we can make arguments for God, even if that were the case, right. Um, that even if we are skeptical of the external world, we can still have certain arguments for God. He's got various, his kind of ontological esque arguments for God. And then he's like, once we get to a morally perfect and supreme being, we can, we can trust that that being wouldn't deceive us, for example. Mm-hmm. And since a morally perfect being wouldn't deceive us, I really don't have to worry about the external world being a complete illusion. Now you might not agree with all of Descartes arguments, but there's something there's something like to that approach, right? And I think Planiga kind of draw, you know, um, draws from that a little bit. It's like, yeah, you know, like, you know, kind of like assuming theism um, 
like it just seems like we would we would have warrant for something like proper functionalism the fact that we were designed to mm. operate a certain way and as long as we're like in the environment we're designed to operate in like we're not like at a really high altitude or underwater where we might not see things clearly or something like that it seems like we have basis for these this these this idea of a properly basic belief so i don't so they're they're different traditions but i think that they um kind of uh they have important similarities and also Plantinga makes a very strong argument, a very famous argument. It's called the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And, and the argument is an epi- it's epistemological in nature where he says, well, if, if naturalism is true, the way that we're supposed to believe that our cognitive faculties developed would sort of undermine any justification we, we would have for any of our beliefs, including our belief in naturalism. So he kind of he kind of turns wow. the argument around. It's a, it's a very cool, it's a very cool wow. argument. Wow, that's um, cool. Yeah, so he kind of turns the, the, the fire back around at, at atheists and naturalists. You say, well, look, at the different theories you have of, for how humans originated and the different philosophies of mind, like uh, epiphenomenalism, there's no reason to think that our beliefs really correspond to reality. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very slow technical argument, so you have yeah. to kind of read the book to get it. But it's a, it's a powerful argument, and it's, a, it's a, certainly a very clever one. It makes you think. Yeah. All right, do you want to just do one more question for me? And Let's do it, my friend. All right. All right. So, um, okay, yeah, let me do, let me do this one. Uh, this is more of a personal one. What aspect of Christianity do you find most challenging? And what do you do about it? Wow, Pat. Um, I'll, I'll state that one of the most challenging things, I think, um, I think the being cognizant of sin on like, and without being overly scrupulous, but like also striving towards holiness. And so I think that's the most difficult thing where on a daily basis, you can be overly critical of yourself. You can be like, Oh, did I sin there? Or um, I said this word and maybe that was sin. And just this constant, you can, if you go down that rabbit hole, you can quickly um, just get trapped into Mm -hmm. like, always feeling sinful, always feeling like you're messing up. And so um, that's a trap there. The other trap would be not being cognizant of any sin. And then you are sinning um, when you're overly confident in your own abilities or like you you just assume that you're like sinless or something like that. Like that would be the opposite, right? So you have to have kind of an in-between thing where it's like, okay, yeah, I, when sin comes up, when I do sin, I recognize it, I repent of it. And honestly, the sacrament of confession has been super helpful. And like also just receiving a general absolution at, at mass, even daily mass is right. very helpful mm-hmm. to like, okay, my, my conscience is clear and I feel relieved and this is good. But the mo- more fundamental thing, and obviously that's very important, but the most fundamental thing to overcome this um, scrupulosity, uh, which I would say, yeah, that's the hardest thing is being cognizant of sin as a Christian, whereas the world is kind of numb to it, right? Um, I say the number one thing to overcome this is to get back to the character of God and just how he really is a loving father and he delights in you and you're in a process and it's okay to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not okay to sin, of course, but it's, he understands our weaknesses and he himself is molding us and guiding us and forming us more and more into little Christ into saints. And so I think going back to the heart of the father is really important to have that right paradigm. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's just what came to the top of my head when you asked that question, but I would say being cognizant of sin on a daily basis and just the battle that is needs to be fought mm-hmm. um, can be tiresome sometimes. Oh yeah. And it can easily tip from one edge to the other. Obviously sometimes I'm dealing with it in such a way that's not true to real Christianity right? I'm dealing in with it way in a way, or I'm viewing God as like a slave driver, but that's not Christianity. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that's maybe more of a personal problem, uh, but a real, but it, but it was a personal question. So that's, yeah, story. well, there you go. Yeah. So driving home, like he's a good father. He loves you. Yes. You're called to be perfect as he is perfect. You're called to be holy as he's holy. And but you can trust that he's good enough to be at work within you to where yeah. that will you'll gradually develop more and more virtue, cooperate with whatever God grace God gives you today. 
Mm -hmm. and you can persevere in that. And that's good news, you know? Yeah, I think good theology helps so much there. You're you're absolutely right. I think this is something that I would imagine, you know, most any Christian and Catholic has probably dealt with. Um, yeah. You know, that, that balance between like, you know, not paying any attention, being inconsiderate, right? And that's, yep. that's, that's kind of where the I, word inconsiderate comes from. Well, what are you not considering? You're not considering the moral law, right? Yeah. Um, that's, you're just not considering what you should be considering versus being, I don't want to say overly considerate, but yeah, scrupulosity, right? Like mm-hmm. constantly like drilling and examining yourself, which is, uh, which, which obviously you want to avoid that. That is not, that is not what the, um, the, that's not what God wants for you. But when you understand that, that God is always working for us and never against us, that God is giving us all the grace that we could ever want or need to become holy and to become, uh, to become saints. And it's really just a matter of getting out of our own way. Um, mm. that, that's, that's always been super helpful for me. Yes. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I'm just so curious now. I got to flip that question right on you. What, what would you say to your own question there? I hate to echo almost exactly what you said, but I think oh. that that's, I think that that's a good one. I think that that's probably right. So, um, you know, I, I really do try to be a saint. We was a homily today and the priest, it was a simple homily. It was a short homily, but it was just uh, about St. Bernard. It's his feast mm. day, right? Yep. Uh, I have a St. Bernard, by the way. Not, oh, nice. They're not, they're not related, um, so far <laughs> as I know. Um, and he gave a beautiful quote from St. Bernard, and it totally slipped my mind right now. Maybe we should, maybe we should look it up and, and find it. But it was to the effect, right, that you know, we have these models of the saints. We have these canonized saints. Uh, because they are models of what we can all become. All of us, every right. single one of us. Like these are not like, it's not, they're like, they're not like Kobe Bryant. It's like Pat Flynn is never becoming Kobe Bryant. It's never happening ever. Yeah. God, God rest him. Right. And he got, my understanding is he actually got to mass the day, the day that he died. So I heard that as well. That's, that's beautiful. But yeah, God rest. Kobe is a beautiful athlete. Um, but there's no way, like, like I would never think of being, being Kobe Bryant. Right? right. But the point of sainthood is that no, we are all called to sainthood, um, and God gives us all the grace um, that that we need to get there. And the question mm-hmm. is, am I going to allow that grace to come in, and am I going to cooperate with that? And so, you know, I get to we get to daily mass. We take the family to daily mass. We get to you know frequent frequent confession at least once a month, often often more than that. And for me, like you, Eric, it's uh, it's sometimes easy to kind of slip into into being, uh, you know, into into scrupulosity, right? Mm. Um, and I've caught myself doing that more because, and I think part of the reason there is because I spent so much of my life being inconsiderate, being yes. numb <laughs> to sin. Mm. Um, that you know, and that's always the balance, right? Make sure you don't swing the pendulum to the other vicious extreme. Right, but the virtue is always that golden mean. The the virtue mm. is always that golden mean between two vicious extremes. And uh, yes, yeah, so I don't know if I'm really adding anything to the conversation here, aside from saying I sympathize with the, your sentiments, and it's it's a real thing. But good theology helps you understand that God is love. God is always working for you, never against you. We're mm. all gonna we're all gonna make mistakes. It's not something you need to uh, bring out the old you know uh, the self flagellation uh, device for or anything like that. Um, just receive, you know, you go, you get that absolution, whether at mass or confession mm-hmm. and you be an optimist. I think that's the other part too, is like, yeah, sin, yeah. Is, sin, sin is gross. It's revolting. We should want nothing to do with it, but Catholics are obligated to be optimists, right? We are right. at least in the long run. <laughs> right. And I think that that's really important. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, thanks everyone for, for tuning in and please help us out by reviewing our podcast, leaving a review, give us those five stars if you want. And uh, thanks again. And thank you, Pat. Awesome, awesome episode today. I really enjoyed it. Tons of fun, man. Beloved, 
I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.